following the stabilization of the Roman state and along with the formation of the Tetrarchy, the emperor used his 20 years reign to work on much needed changes in an attempt to make the empire regain its former strength. In this video, we shall cover the reforms of Diocletian. In order to maintain a large army to protect the borders, the taxation system had to be improved. We do not have information concerning all the taxes collected at the time, but the emperor's reform of 287 revolved around two types of taxes in particular. First, the property tax, called tributum soli. Now, every property owner without exception had to pay it, including those in Italy. It was based on the area and the quality of the land they possessed, and was much of the time paid in kind. New censuses were made, as well as an update of the tax base, as some provinces had not received any for decades. The personal tax which replaced the tributum capitis of the Principate was paid mostly by the lower classes of the countryside who did not pay the property tax, usually peasants and plebeians, while the soldiers were exempt from it. This population also received new, more accurate and more frequent censuses. Taxation was now done by a single administration called the Fiscus. It was headed by a member of the equities class, the rationalist Sumare. He had under his orders many officials who worked in the provinces. The tax collection was left to the local forces, which handed it over to their representatives. The amount of tax paid did not really increase, at least not for everyone. Indeed, what made it unpopular was that the administration now kept a vigilant eye on the population and in addition, it ended privileges. Despite this, it proved to be a successful reform. Between 297 and 303, the provinces decreased in size. It went from less than 50 to around 120 provinces. The goal was to bring the government officials and governors closer to the population, to better apply taxes and laws. Egypt and Italy lost their particular status. They were split into multiple provinces, and the latter even lost its tax immunity. Only Rome and its surroundings remained unaffected. Diocletian imposed three types of governors, depending on the provinces they were assigned to. The praises, the most widespread one, the correctories, and the senatorial proconsuls. The governors saw their actions limited to the civil scale, but obtained extended powers. Public order conservation, public services management, laws publishing, imperial decrees enactment, judicial power, and tax collection. They were no longer able to surround themselves with friends or clients in the same way as under the Principate or the Republic. There were now real officials. For example, a post of curator appeared. He was the governor's representative in each city inside the province. Many privileges were withdrawn from the cities. Local coinage ended, obligation to adopt Roman law and loss of their tax immunity. These reforms also saw the creation of 12 dioceses, each headed by a vicarius. Those men had the authority over all of the governors inside their diocese, except the senatorial proconsuls of Africa and Asia, who were directly linked to the emperor. In addition, they had a lot of powers in civilian matters, and were in charge of the frontier fortifications. The objective was to supervise the governors and specifically to keep an eye on tax collection. The dioceses were themselves regrouped into Praetorian prefectures, which were approximately the four pieces of territory that the tetrarchs shared among themselves. In summary, the administration was made more efficient by increasing its weight and being simplified. The economy 
was in bad shape and Diocletian understood it well. Inflation considerably increased in recent decades. In an effort to counter this and to stabilize the situation, he tried to reform the monetary system. Some coins were intensively produced and soon, private workshops were closed to guarantee total control over coin production. Being in constant need of precious metals, the state even started requisitioning some from the population. New coins were also introduced, such as the Argentius. Seeing that the monetary reforms were not working, the Edict of Maximum Prices was acted on in 301. This edict set the upper limit for the prices of many goods, as well as for wages in a number of jobs. However, it ended up disrupting trade, and the black market gained influence. The currency was devalued too much in comparison with the fixed prices, and so, it proved to be ineffective and unpopular, which led to many unnecessary executions. The number of military personnel increased under the Tetrarchy. The Roman army grew to around 500,000 men. There were four ways to reach this number of soldiers. Volunteering, the systematic enrollment of all soldiers' sons, the recruitment of barbarians in the army after the defeat of the latter or with alliance agreements, and Protostasia, the innovation of the Tetrarchy. It was a tax that linked a man to its wealth. A landowner had to provide a few men to fill the ranks of the army. These men were either employees or barbaric mercenaries. During the crisis of the 3rd century, the military demands had grown in such a way that there was now a distinction between frontier troops and campaign armies. Under Diocletian, these distinctions seem to have been formalized, as each Tetrax had direct access to an elite reserve called Comitatus. This flexibility was further developed by a reorganization of the subdivisions inside the army. The legions had now various sizes, though it seems that most of them went from the average of 5,000 men to around 1,000 men each. These legions was supplemented by various auxiliary units, such as the Vexillationes. As civilian and military power were now split, the military forces of one or a group of provinces were in the hands of a dux. This army no longer had the objective of expanding the empire, but to defend it. It was with this in mind that many fortresses were rebuilt and the cities were fortified. The Diocletianus Traitor was an obvious example of this. It was a network of fortresses along the Syrian border, strengthened during this period. The imperial cult, based on the official Roman religion, was here to guarantee the unity of the empire. The emperor was no longer the first citizen, the Senate was losing more and more of its influence as the republican institution was disappearing to be replaced by a strong, centralized, almost theocratic government. In fact, each of the two Jovian and Herculean deities ruled the empire through the human figures of Diocletian and Maximian. The emperors were now distant figures before which people had to prostrate. However, a certain population was in complete opposition to this institution, the Christians. This community continued to gain in importance since its appearance in the first century, and its monotheism went against the Tetrarchic ideology. Since 260 and Gallienus's tolerance edict, Christians have lived under the so-called little peace of the church. Diocletian had so far been lenient towards the Christians, but ultimately decided to act against them. It was first the Manichaeism followers who began to suffer persecutions between 297 and 302. Eventually, a series of four edicts were published against the Christians as soon as 303. It was then ordered to destroy their places of worship and to limit them socially, 
by imposing many restrictions on their lives. Yet, the latter often refused their new situation and consequently, many executions took place. The application of these edicts was not equivalent everywhere and during the following years, the repression eventually decreased in intensity, especially in the West, but more slowly in the East. Diocletian showed that he wanted to restore the Roman Empire to its former power. To achieve this, he grabbed it firmly and proceeded to a heavier degree of control over the territory and the population. The administrative and fiscal reforms proved to be quite successful, while his economic and religious policies were not very effective. The absolutism he demonstrated set the trend for the next centuries of Roman rule during the late empire. 